Have you ever suffered a crushing, embarrassing, infuriating defeat in your music career? Look, you wouldn't be the only one. It would be quite unusual for a musician or a music entrepreneur to go their entire career without encountering some serious hardship. I've been there myself. But when do you give up and move on? Most people quit after the first defeat and after a long, hard road with a second, a third, and fourth offense. The crowd tends to get thinner and thinner. More and more people give up. It's not that you can avoid failure. It's what you do with it that's going to make all the difference. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this episode of the New Music Industry Podcast. Today, I am passing the mic with former manager of the police. He's worked with countless artists whose names you would surely recognize, the Bangles, the Go-Go's, R.E.M. and others, and the man that hardly needs an introduction, Miles Copeland. How are you today, Miles? I'm very fine. Of course, you you for, you forget the, the police and Sting and Squeeze, and <laughs> uh, but the Bangles and the Go-Go's were very important, so they're, I'm glad you mentioned them, and R.E.M., of course. Yeah, I actually did mention the police up front. Maybe it wasn't emphasized enough, but that's that's the big one that, that always catches people's attention. So you launched your new book, Two Steps Forward, One Step Back in July, and explains how an unmitigated disaster was the butterfly effect that led to some of your greatest successes that you're known for today. What is something we can learn from those moments that make us want to throw in the towel? Well, you know, when when I thought about writing a book, you know, I, I really didn't want to write a memoir, which was sort of self-serving in the sense that, you know, when you think of memoir, you think about, you know, well, this is all what I did and aren't I great? And, you know, you should you should like what I do, whatever. But I, I wanted to write a book that was more of a motivational book and a book that would explain uh, something that would, it would relate to somebody that's starting a business, whether it be in the music or starting a restaurant or whatever to me to make it just about the music business was a little too small and a little bit meaningless so i I wanted to make it more than that and the title two steps forward and one step back basically is sort of my way of saying look you know you as long as you keep moving forward you're going to make mistakes there's going to have to be steps backward but sometimes those mistakes can be as important as the successes and sometimes you can learn more from mis- mistakes than you can s- from successes. So, you know, I was successful, I guess, which is why I guess it's worth interviewing me and 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 why there's a book in the first place. But I did make mistakes, and and I think that those are part of the the story that I that I wanted to tell. Absolutely, and you know that really some of the things you mentioned there are what make you the perfect guest for this show because. There's either musicians who are looking to make their music careers into a business or structured a little more like a business. And there's going to be artists and managers and executives and maybe even people who want to start their own record labels or studios listening to this show. So, you know, what you said about starting a business is really, really spot on. It's what a big part of what we do. Well, the other the other thing is, is that I, I tried to, you know, there were some lessons that I thought were important to put forward, you know, that that uh, sometimes people don't think about. And, you know, I guess, you know, having had 50 years in the music business, you know, I did learn a few things, you know, mm-hmm. and and sometimes, you know, you learn things that you didn't really expect at the beginning, you know, and and like one of the lessons uh, that I that I say in the book was if if you make the answer, yes, easy, you're likely to get yes as an answer. If you make the answer no easy, you're likely to get no as an answer. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but, you know, I use the example of, you know, when when I had the police and I wanted to get a record deal and I I knew I had nothing to recommend the group other than a great record. You know, I couldn't walk into the record company and whether it be A&M or any other record company and say, you know, I got a great tour. They they got a big fan base. uh, This is this is a slam dunk hit, you know, I actually had nothing. The, the band hmm. had no tour. They, they had no fan base. There was no press. There was nothing, basically. All I had was the record. So I went into the record company and I said, look, you know, here's the deal. The record's yours. No risk. 
tell your salespeople they can they can press up as many as they think they can sell. Only thing you have to do is pay me the highest royalty that you can pay when it sells and if it sells. So the A&R guy, here he is, you know, he's, he's looking at doing a record deal. And uh, all, I've eliminated all of the question marks that would be going through his head. He wouldn't be asking himself, you know, will this eat up my budget for the year? So, you know, will, will, will my boss be angry at me if it's a failure? You know, all those sort of negatives that would have stopped him from signing, he eliminated. So all of a sudden, you know, he would listen to the music and decide whether he really liked the music or not, you know. And thankfully, he did like it, and we made the deal, you know. Later on, again, with Jerry Moss, you know, I knew that if I got Jerry Moss uh, to, you know, cut a check, he's going to want to listen to the music. And he listens to the Buzzcocks or the Cramps or Walla Voodoo or whoever, he's going to say no, you know. So I said, look, here's the deal. No money. I don't need your money. Just have your salespeople press what they think they can sell. I'll make, I'll deliver the records. And I guess Jerry Moss just decided, well, you know, what the hell, what have I got to lose? So he said, yes. And I think that's a lesson that, that um, was, was, you know, patently obvious. And, and two of my big successes, which were both, both the case of the, uh, the police and, and uh, IRS records, you know, and that that's the kind of, lesson I wanted to put forward in the book. There's a bunch of rabbit trails I want to go down, but I think the first thing that I would really like to emphasize and not step over is what you said about mistakes. And I've watched some of your earlier interviews and you really do talk about failures. And so why is that such an important thing to look at? Well, because I think everybody has failures and a lot of people get depressed from them and, and think that they can't, you know, okay, it's over. You know, I remember somebody saying to me when I, when I, had star trucking and basically lost everything and was on the verge of bankruptcy. And one of my agent friends said, well, Miles Copeland's over. Well, you know, as my father once said, he said, you know, there's a difference between being poor and being broke. You know, poor is an attitude. Broke is just a circumstance, you know. So I was broke, but I wasn't poor, you know. I had no money, but that didn't mean that I couldn't, I didn't have a brain. I couldn't, I didn't know anything. And it just so happened that my comeuppance, my failure happened just when the punk rock thing was happening in England. And the reality was, is that no one was paying attention to the punks. And I did pay attention to them because really they were the only people that would listen to me because nobody else cared. You know, Mm. Miles Copeland has no money. So who needs him? You know, whereas the punks, they just wanted somebody to recognize the fact that, that they existed, you know. And I got quite excited about what they were doing anyway, you know, so it was actually a curious phenomena that, you know, my disaster put me in a position where I had to be open to people that were also dismissed, you know, because the music business completely dismissed the pole punk rock thing, you know, and I mean, even A&M records, they dropped the sex pistols, you know, they signed them and I think they, they were with the label for three days or something before they got dropped, you know, but, you know, that was really, uh, you know, I came along at a time when no one was paying attention to punk rock in England. And I started paying attention. And before I knew it, you know, I became a a big player in that field, you know, and of course things grew and the police happened and squeeze and et cetera, et cetera. So things grew from that. So from, from a failure out came success. Yeah. And what I'm really hearing in that is that you followed your passion. You know, a lot of people will, either pay lip service to it or talk about following their passion when in fact, you know, they're more worried about the marketability of something, but you went ahead and I I had a very simple rule. It was this, don't look for what other people tell you is going to happen. You know, Mm. just look yourself, be honest with yourself. You know, do you like the music or not? You know, do you like the record or not? Do you like the, the food or not, whatever it is the, the the business is, you know. And the reality was, I said, look, you know, I I I like this record, I like this music, and I'm not so crazy that I can't be the only person in the world that's going to like it. So all I need to do is find the people like me who will like this music, you know. So I I really went with my own likes, you know. And a lot of people are afraid of their own likes, 
you know, I'm, I've, I've had experiences with people where, you know, they'll, friends of mine will come over and I'll play them a, a, a new record or something, you know, and, and uh, I'll ask them, you know, what's, what's the song you think's the single? What do you think's the best song on the record? And inevitably they'll choose the song that is the, is the hit song, you know, and I'll, I then say, well, you know, you should be an A and R person. You know, you've got a good ear. You know, you should. Oh no, no, I can't do that. I, I, I can't take. I can't. You know, they won't have the. They don't have the faith in their own judgment. You know, and the reality is, when you're driving down the highway, you know, and and you're listening to the radio, a song comes on you don't like, you change channels. You know, so everybody is a is an A and R person. Everybody is making choices. Just be honest with yourself, and you know. It, it, make make the choice if you can make the choice why not you could be an a and r person you know and the only caveat of course is that and i also say this in the book is that you know i i entered the punk rock movement with no money so the reality is you know things had to be affordable you know if the go-go's had said to me well we want a million dollars i would have said well sorry i can't sign you know <laughs> Uh, so the reality was i was the only game in town and the price was right so we made a deal. Yeah, you make some excellent points there. We can all make recommendations. You know, there's all things that we're interested in. And if people are interested in us, then they're by virtue of that are going to be interested in what we share with them as well. Yeah, I, I you know, I, that's one of the points of the book really was to say, you know, you can have, if, if you believe in yourself, you know, and you believe in what you like, you know, all you need to do is find other people like you. Yeah, believing in yourself. That's a big one. How would you unpack that for our listeners? Well, I, I, in my case, you know, I, I mean, look, let, let's be honest here. I, I went to, you know, college in Birmingham, Alabama, and then I went to Beirut, Lebanon, uh, and to do my MA degree, thinking I would go into Middle East, you know, into, into Middle East business of some sort. Prior to that, I'd been in Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria. So let, let's... <laughs> These are not centers of rock and roll. You know, these are not mm -hmm. centers of where you're going to be listening to, to great music. So there was no breeding ground. There's no training. You know, I didn't know anything. And when I went into the music business, I literally didn't know anything. I didn't know which, which clubs booked groups. You know, I didn't know who the agents were. I didn't know who promoters were. But the reality was, is I knew what I liked. And I went with that, basically, you know, and and I found people that that uh, that could play music that I liked and I figured out a way to get to the marketplace and and it really wasn't that difficult because I had the energy and the, and the will to do it you know but I run across so many people who who, who just who, who have great ideas but then you say okay we'll go do it then it's oh well I I, I can't do that you know I, I can't do that well why not you know circling back to something that you said earlier you know your book really makes a point to say it's not about trivializing failures and it's not about boasting about your accomplishments. I had to make a similar decision for my own book, the new music industry a few years ago to make it authentic and not just an encyclopedia of, of music and knowledge. Why did you feel that was an important decision? When I wrote the, wrote the book, you know, one of, one of the things that occurred to me all the way through is that, you know, I, first place, I, there were things that I'd forgotten, you know, I'd done, I'd done a lot, you know, so I, I had to do some research and, as I was researching, I, was, I talked to people I hadn't talked to in many, many years. I also read other people's books, you know, to find out whether what I was saying was was accurate, you know, uh, because a lot of people wrote things and either they forgot or they cut, you know, they they little bit of poetic license, you know. There were a lot of things wrong, you know, uh, about the police and about a lot of the bands, you know. So I, I decided that if I wrote a book, it at least had to be honest. It had to be straightforward and it had to be real, you know. And when, when, when a, I was asked, you know, do you want a ghostwriter? You know, somebody had to help you write it. I said, no, I'm going to write every single word. I want it to be from me. I'm telling people that I wrote it and I want it to be honest, you know, and it, it really is an expression of, you know, what I think. I, I did get have to correct some things because I got dates wrong or I, I didn't, so I didn't, you know, I couldn't remember everything accurately. So I had to talk to some people, you know, and, and it took, well, I guess, I don't know, six, seven months to write, you know, to check on things and whatever. But I, and I did order, you know, books from Jules Holland and Chris Dippard and all the police guys and, 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 uh, 
you know, even Luke Sky from from fashion, you know. And I spoke to William Orbit and, you know, Pat McDonald from Timbuk3 and all sorts of people to try to get the reality of what really happened, you know. And that's really what the book was about. It was about my experiences, but experiences that would relate to any business and lessons you could learn from what I went through that could be applied to any business. That was basically the idea of it. Yeah, memory is a funny thing. None of us remember everything accurately, right? So I really appreciate your commitment to accuracy and authenticity and detail that you went to the trouble of collecting all these stories. I also like that you said you chose not to use a ghostwriter. I, I think your your book came out better because of it, if I'm being honest. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, one of the, the, the things I was afraid of was that, you know, I would have a publisher say, you know, well, yeah, Miles, you gotta, we need more dirt, you know, <laughs> come on, let's have some stories about Sting doing some naughty stuff, you know, or mm -hmm. uh, the police or who, whatever, you know, but thankfully the publisher just let me get on with it. You know, he made a few suggestions, but he, nobody re wrote anything or rewrote anything or whatever, you know? Um, so it really is, I, I did the book basically, you know, so I, I, you know, I didn't, I, I couldn't really, you know, talk about my life in the music business and then have somebody else help me write it. You know, I just wouldn't have sounded right, you know. So, you know, honesty and being straightforward and, you know, it is what it is. That's that's the kind of, you know, what I was saying in the book, you know, it is what it is. And and you know, I made mistakes. I learned from them. I may have had successes. I learned from them. And a lot of those successes and mistakes would apply to any business whether it be a restaurant or a rock and roll band or whatever, you know. Even if you didn't cover, you know, the juiciest sting stories or whatever, I really like that you touched on your own failures, right? And uh, really an authentic story. This is something that a lot of people don't do, actually. <laughs> it's actually pl a plague in the podcast world now that I can't always get answers that aren't curated and, well, and organized by a PR. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the message, one of the, you know, the intentions of the book was to entertain, of course. I mean, thankfully, I didn't have to have a lot of salacious stories, you know. There were pretty funny, wacky stuff that were happening because I was signing pretty wacky, interesting groups, you know. I mean, yes. let's be honest, the cramps are interesting, you know. <laughs> Wall of Voodoo, Stan Ridgeway is interesting. Uh, John Napolitano from Concrete Blonde. I mean, they're interesting. Sting is interesting. You know, these are people that have you know, important things to say and, and sometimes crazy things, you know, and th those are funny, you know, and, and they're entertaining. So the book, the book was not trying to, you know, whitewash anything. I, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't need to tell, you know, stories to, to beef up the, the, you know, what was happening in my life because the reality was that I had some pretty wild acts and they did some pretty wild things. And all I needed to do is tell, tell that, you know, those stories, and believe me, those were enough, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's quite compelling all its own. That was definitely. You know, helpful. actually, the, the the one guy that I was kind of curious about, you know, what he, what he would think of the book, I actually got a got a, a email from Pat McDonald from Timbuk3. Mm. And he said, Miles, I just want you to know I bought the book. And any negative things you said about me, I probably deserved. <laughs> I always I always liked Pat McDonald, you know, and, and I actually said because because, you know, he was an artist that I always called him an art monster because he turned down millions of dollars because he didn't want to have his song go for a commercial, you know, mm. and I say in the book, you know, if I could do one thing over again, it would be accept the money and send a check to Pat and say, Pat, cry yourself to death, but you're going to you're going to go <laughs> buy a house. Yeah, absolutely. That would have been a lot of fun. What are your thoughts on how the music industry has changed over the decades? There's been format shifts, paradigm shifts, upheavals. Are we living in the most exciting times there's ever been? Or is the music business going to hell in a handbasket? Well, you know, I've had acts say to me many times going way back, you know, and they say it today or they say it way back in 1969 when I first started, you know. And it's like, hey, man, it's not about, you know, it's about the music. You know, and I go, well, you know, sorry, it's not about the music. Number one, it's about getting noticed. Mm. If you get noticed, then people can, then it's about the music. Because if you don't get noticed, nobody's going to ever hear your music. So it doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. what's important is you need to know how to get into the marketplace, how to get noticed, whether it be 
like Elvis Presley, shake, wiggling his hips, you know, or and wearing funny clothes, or the Beatles with long hair, or Elton John's wild antics, and you know, uh, and any of these things. But if you look at a lot of the a lot of the biggest acts, they all were, you know did something that got them noticed you have to get noticed first you know and you can get lucky it can be a song you know that just captures the imagination and off it goes and goes to number one or something you know but i always look for things that would get noticed you know the bank you know the bangles or the go-go's you know i mean when i first met the go-go's i mean it's five girls you thought well five girls that's a good that's a good gimmick that's that's kind of <laughs> cool you know and it turns out that's the reason why they didn't get signed. You know, yes. they were all girls, you know, but to me, it was cool that it was all girls who wrote their own songs and wrote their own music and were great and, and were vivacious and the kids loved them. And, and, you know, what's not to like, you know? So, but I was, I looked around, I was the only A&R guy in the room who was ready to sign the Go-Go's. Mm. And I, I don't think the Go-Go's were that excited about signing the IRS records. Cause we were a kind of a, you know, we were like, as Charlotte Caffey, the songwriter of the Go-Go said to me, she said, you know, IRS was the home of all the homeless people and degenerates and losers. If, if you couldn't get a record deal, you went to IRS records, you know. So we, so we signed up a lot of people that just wouldn't get signed anywhere else. So we ended up with some pretty fascinating groups, you know, whether it be, you know, Jim Scafish or Oingo Boingo or Walla Voodoo or the Cramps or the Buzzcocks or Stranglers or REM, whatever, you know. So uh, IRS records ended up as a home of a lot of pretty wild people, you know, and a lot of people told me about the police. They said, well, you know, they'll never happen. There's three, bleep, three blonde guys. Ah, they're playing punk rock. It's never going to happen. But I had faith in, in my own judgments. And that that's really what, what in the end paid off. Yeah, that's really insightful because I have noticed with certain artists lately, it really is kind of the personality or maybe what they stand for politically that is now attracting people to them. And, and the music is almost secondary in its own way. It's like it's there and it's available and people can go listen to it, but they're drawn to the personality that shows up on TV or in a podcast or maybe just tweeting all day long, something I've, I've seen with certain artists that, that people really gravitate towards, it seems. Yeah. So, so the, so the music business really, I mean, the delivery system has changed. Now you can go to the internet, you can do things, more things on your own, yep. but you still have to do them. You know, yeah. the lesson, the lesson, you know, you still have to get noticed, you know, maybe there's a different way now, but the job is still the same, get noticed, you know, then have music people like, you know, so I, I don't think the music business has changed as much as people keep wanting to say it is mm -hmm. because they're looking mm -hmm. at, you know, they're looking at the delivery system. They're not looking at the essence of what really makes something work and getting attention, you know, is, is what the, is the name of the game. I mean, look, look, if you want to learn about, you know, how to get attention, look at Donald Trump, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's a guy that got elected by just being nuts, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a, probably a lot of fans out there, but, you know, let's be honest, mm -hmm. you know, the guy used the media to his advantage, same way as Malcolm McLaren did, as I yes. say in the book, you know, the, they were, they were people who knew how to get attention. And then, it, then you, then you can vote one way or another, you know, you can decide you're going to buy the record or not, or you're going to vote for the politician or not, you know, uh, or go to the restaurant or not, but you get noticed. I'm really internalizing that lesson. I have a lot of great content out there and I'm, and I'm super consistent and regular with the delivery of it. And now <laughs> going to spend a little more time getting that attention. Well, you know, the, the, the old saying, if it bleeds, it leads, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like when you turn on the news, you're not going to hear, well, it, it was a great day today and everything was wonderful <laughs> and fantastic, you know, and uh, that's the news. And thank you very much. Tune in tomorrow. No, you tune in and it's like 20 people died in Afghanistan and there's floods in India and there's, you know, you, you, all the bad news gets attention. Oh, exactly. And the media, you know, the media is, is, a, is a great lesson. You know, I think mm. if people want to learn how to, you know, what's the, what, how do you get attention? Turn on the TV, watch advertising, you know, how, how does an ad get atten your attention? Why do you buy this can of beans and not that one? Why do you want to buy cornflakes instead of, you know, look at the commercial and ask yourself, okay, why is this commercial working for me? And this other commercial isn't. And, though, and just by being honest with your own judgment, 
you can you can learn a lot. You know, I mean, I think I think you can learn a lot just by turning on the TV and watching commercials. Yes. And you can say, well, one one of the things that you do notice in commercials is is the consistency of certain companies will do like there'll be a one particular spokesperson the or be an, for for an insurance company or something and this this person will constantly be there or the gecko you know the for for the for the for the insurance insurance company or the, or target has this circle you know and they keep hammering that home because the job is they they're going to have 30 seconds they don't want to spending spend time telling you about the product you already know oh the circle that's target so now they can just get straight to the message you know they're having a discount on something or other so i think i think that you can learn a lot just by watching tv you know whether it be a, a movie why and you ask yourself why does this work for me or why doesn't it excellent points i mean these days when i flip through instagram it's no longer to see who's bragging and who's doing what and who traveled where i'm just looking for the thing that interrupts my pattern completely and i have to i'm forced to pay attention to and then i analyze and model and create something like it in my own instagram feed like that's now my won't when i'm looking at instagram it's no longer just to like for pleasure or for fun well you know i i always say to people you know you want to get attention i mean if if Kiss walk into the room all all decked out with with blood dripping from you know Gene Simmons's mouth or something, you're you're gonna notice it, you know. And and in, in walks another group that are wearing spandex trousers and look like every other group, you're not gonna notice them, you know. I, I recount in in the the book, you know, one story of a band that came to you know, we we signed at IRS Records. I asked them how they got their name and they and they gave me some lame idea. Well, we put names in a hat. I said, well. But there's no story to that, you know. And I said, look, put yourself in in the in the shoes of a journalist. Your job is to do a review of this group. And one question is, okay, how'd you get your name? And your answer is, oh, we put the names in a hat. Oh, that's how you got your name? Well, that's not interesting. Well, that means you're going to get a couple of lines in a review. But make up a story, you know. Make, well, we we uh, a, a, a spaceship landed from Mars and it had the name of the thing. Paint. All of a sudden, it's like as crazy as it. The crazier, in a way, the better, because it, the journalist is sitting here thinking, "Well, at least I can write a story," you know. So make make it easy for them. Exaggerate, you know. When when Stewart mm -hmm. gets asked about, you know, how did he come up with the name of the police? He had a great line. He said, "You know, there are cars all over the world driving around." with with the name of my band painted on the side <laughs> you know and you when awesome. you think about it that's a great line it you is know? That, and, and if you're a journalist writing an article that that's going to appear in the article yeah. you know because it's a good line you know and the, those those one-liners are are things where you know if you could throw out one-liners that, that that are catchy they're going to appear in the article the last thing a journalist wants to hear is well, you know, I don't know. Uh, I I kind of like, you know, I drew I drew a name out of a hat, you know, and well, that's like, what's the significance of it? That's just like nothing, you know. Yes. Make a story up, you know. You know, you've had a lot of great tips and insights into everything. I have multiple takeaways already. I guess reflecting on your failures and successes and everything you've gone through, what's something you'd like to impart to aspiring music entrepreneurs, managers, executives, anyone wanting to make a dent on the music industry? The, the music industry is, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of hate that word, the idea, because right. really, you know, it's about, okay, what do you believe in and what do you want to do? You know, you find something you particularly like and you go for it, you know, mm -hmm. and I look at some of the managers of the bands that I, you know, that I, John Landau, when, when he, when he saw Bruce Springsteen, you know, he, he was a journalist. And he, he saw an act that he thought was the, the greatest thing ever, you know, and he wrote an article that said, look, I've just seen the future and it's Bruce Springsteen, you know, and he ended up becoming the manager, you know, and I think the, re the reality is you, you, it's easier to fight for something you believe in than it is for something you don't. Mm. So find something you believe in, you know, whether it be an act or a record, you know, I've had, I've had groups come to me and say, we want you to be our manager because you're a tough guy, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we, we want you to go beat up the record company and make our record happen. And so they, they, and I say, well, let me hear the music, you know? And so they play me the music and I go, well, you know, I don't think I'm 
can go beat up the record company because I don't <laughs> believe in that music myself, you know. And the group would go like, well, but you're but you're the tough guy. You're supposed to go tell the record company to do it. And I'm saying, well, you know, you can take the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You know, if if it's not in the grooves, it ain't gonna happen, you know. And I and I'm I'm not good enough to fight for things I don't believe in, you know. It's I, I have a much easier time fighting for things I do believe in. And, you know, I'm I, and I also say in the book that sometimes. I was a little too honest for my own good, you know. I mean, my my Duran Duran story, you know. I actually was the manager of Duran Duran for about a week. Signed contract, everything was great. We go for a celebration dinner, and they asked me how much money they're going to make from the from the the record, you know. This 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 was the reformed five members of the band, you know. And I knew that if I told them the truth, it it would, you know, it just wouldn't fly, you know. So I decided. Once in my life, I'm going to exaggerate. So I exaggerated. I I said that they were we we could get probably four times what I thought we really could. So I thought I had exaggerated enough, and that they would be excited by that. Well, the next day they they call me up and they say, "You're not the right guy for us because you don't believe in us." And I say, "Well, what, what are you talking about?" They, I thought they'd smelled a rat. I thought they'd smelled the fact that I had exaggerated. No, they 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 wanted a lot more. They wanted even more money and i just said to them look guys i'm sorry i'm not good enough I, I i doubt i could get you the money that i actually said i could get but there's no way that i can get the money that you want and if you can find somebody you can by all means make a deal with them well of course the group ended up making a deal for peanuts and <laughs> their record didn't happen you know so but of course they did very well touring so basically you know i was not a great liar and over the years, I, you know, one of the fallacies, I guess, you know, some managers are very good at lying. They'll tell an artist what they want to hear. And unfortunately, I'm not particularly good at that. And I said, that's one of my failures. I, I never, I, I liked artists like Sting. When Sting said to me, just tell me the truth, you know, don't lie to me. Uh, and I respected that, you know, and I respected those artists that wanted the truth. I did not respect those artists who wanted me to tell them what they wanted to hear, you know. Because the real reality is, if 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 that's the artist you sign, then you're going to have to lie to him all the time, you know. And I just I just was not prepared to do that. So I did very well with Sting for 25 years, you know, with Jules Holland, with with so many other bands. Because I told them the truth, you know. Something that I often share with artists who are looking to get booked more often is when I'm reading their bios. It often says something about how many radio stations they've been played on or what festivals they played. And I said, that's all great that, you know, you have this great quote and you played at this festival and you've been on these 18 radio stations and you won this award. But where's the story? <laughs> I like as a booker, if I can't tell your story, how can I promote you? How can I get you into this event? Well, uh, that's that's it. That's it. The story, you know, is, is like, how do we get noticed? You know, I mean, yeah. you can say, well, you know, you can quote facts and figures. Well, we sold X number of records. Yeah, but yeah, but. Why, why did anybody book you? Why did you play those places? What's, what's the meaning behind everything? You know, you, you look at, you look at, you know, the Elton John movie mm. or, you know, Freddie Mercury. These were not, you know, and the fact that they, that, that uh, Elton John movie started with him in rehab, it, it was not sweetness and light. You know, if he hadn't been in the rehab, there would have been no story. I remember, and I recount in the book, you know, I, I, was managing the Moody Blues for a period of time. And they're a, they're a great musical group. They've always had great music. You know, Knights in White Satin is one of the great classics, you know. And I tried to get a documentary made about them with, with uh, VH1, you know. And, you know, I was sat down and they said, well, uh, did they murder anybody? Did they run off with anybody else's wife? Did they, where, where, where are the, where, where's the story? You know, and I said, well, they, they, they make good music and they've toured all over the world. And uh, yeah, but they're, they're just nice people. Right. And I said, well, yeah, they're nice people. And they said, yeah, but there's no story in that. So fuck you out of my office. <laughs> so basically, you know, there was no story. So I never could get a documentary with with um, the Moody Blues. You look at the latest documentary on the Go-Go's and, you know, you'll see in that. I mean, I, I'm in it, thankfully, but. The, the fact that the group broke up and they sued each other and they were into drugs and all these other things, you know, and they had a number one record, 
you put the two together and all of a sudden there's a story. There is a great story to the Go-Go's, yeah. you know? And uh, I think that's what ma made the documentary work. If it had all been sweetness and light, they sign IRS records, they have a number one record, they're all nice girls, all it's all happening. No, they were, it was nuts, you know, they, they, they broke up and they sued each other, they hated each other, then they reformed, you know. There's a story there. There's a story to, to a lot of the bands that have succeeded I mean, Elvis Presley was a story, you know, um, the Beatles, the, the Rolling Stones, the, you know, the story is important. And, and you're right. You know, don't bore me. You know, that's the last <laughs> thing we want. Don't bore me. That's right. It's the number one sin in marketing is to be boring. As they say in the entertainment industry, start in the middle of the action. I've started telling the story a lot in my own writing that. There, one day I was sitting in front of an Italian restaurant in my two-tone blue RAV4 with two flat tires, sobbing because I couldn't pay my bills. I couldn't was about to lose my home, was working five very poorly paying jobs. Uh, and that was the moment that, that I thought, like, nobody cared. This is the end for me. There's nothing else. And then what happens next is, well, that's the story in between. And it wasn't all success either, mind you. People can relate to that kind of stuff. It makes a big yeah. difference for them. You know, my father, my father used to say, you know, uh, not not that I took it to heart totally, you know, but I certainly I think it was a great lesson. He said, "Don't let the truth stand in the way of a good story." He knew that really, what you, to get attention, you need a story. So exaggerate a little bit, you know. You hear about hype so much, you know. But wild clothes and, and funny hairdo. And, I mean, Lady Gaga, if she walks out mm -hmm. on stage looking like a bank clerk, you know, is anybody going to pay attention? Probably not, you know. She walks out wearing wild clothes and outlandish this and that, you know, and all of a sudden everybody pays attention. You know? So it's rare that you can just rely on the music, you know. It's much safer to rely on the music, sure, but add to it a story and something that's interesting and a look and an image and all those other things. Well, my listeners are interested in all kinds of resources. So I want to ask you if there's any books that have helped you on your journey. I don't read books that much. You know, I look read, I, I watch TV and I, and I, I used to read a lot, but I don't read much anymore. I to tell you the truth. I, it's, mm. it's one of my failings, you know, but I'll, I'll read magazines to, to see what the news is and I'll watch the news, you know, but I like to switch. I watch left wing and right wing and all the different things. I don't think, I don't want to be pre, I, I, I don't watch just MSNBC, let's say. I also watch Fox, you know. I watch uh, the, the regular news. I watch Al Jazeera. I watch Fr France 24. I watch the BBC because I want to I want to hear different inputs because they, you get jolted. If you only listen to what you want to hear, you're going to miss everything. You know, you're going to miss a lot of things and you're going to only see things in one way. And sometimes it's the, it's the tangent that works. So I always want to be open to a left field tangent that I never expected, you know, like, like my life. I mean, I never expected to be in the music business, you know. The police never expected Roxanne to be the song that changed the, their game, mm -hmm. you know. In songwriting, you know, I, the songs that I do, I do these songwriter retreats, you know, where I, I put Keith Urban together with the two Go-Go's. Keith Urban is this Australian guitar player you know, who's ended up marrying Nicole Kidman and become a big superstar. Yep. But, you know, he, he if he hadn't come to the castle and written songs with the Go-Go's, it never would have happened, you know. So who would imagine this Australian guitar player doing country music writes with two punk girls from L.A., you know, <laughs> and has a number one song, you know. And I've had a number of that situation, you know. So I I, I think that it's, it's the weird mixtures that sometimes work. The, because they kind of break the rule and they jolt you into into looking at something anew, you know. Desert Rose with Sting, you know, with Chef Mommy. Mm. Uh, the fact that he had this Arab guy singing, you know, and with Sting, well known, but Chef Mommy's voice is so brilliant, it jolted you into saying, well, I really like this, you know, and that, that song became a huge hit for Sting, you know. So I, I think following the 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 the, the rule necessarily is is you know, sometimes it makes sense, but a lot of times it doesn't, you know, but I, I, I always like to be open to a left field tangent, which is why I don't listen to what I, I, I want to hear, you know, would I, I would I rather listen to MSNBC and be told that, 
you know, all, everything is should be one way. No, I want to hear Fox. I want to hear all these other views, even the radical right and the radical left. I don't care. I just want to hear all the different views because out of all of those views, I might learn something or get jolted into a, you know, thinking of something totally as a tangent. But the point is, I'm open to the to different inputs. So I think that's very important. So one of my lessons, you know, if, if I said to any musician, be open to any kind of input. Don't be too concerned whether, you know, you're playing to four people or, or a million or whether you're doing a journalist that, that is, you know, not particularly well known versus one that is very well known. You, you never know. It could be that this journalist who isn't very well known today could be a superstar later, you know. Or he writes something that somebody picks up on, and next thing you know, it, it happens. You, you never know where the break is coming from. So be open to all of it. I couldn't agree with you more, especially in today's media climate, where I think the slant is is stronger than it's ever been. There's a narrative that wants to be pushed, and it is being pushed. And so it's really good to get your information from a variety of sources and angles if you, know, you want to begin to see things from a different perspective. And like you said, use that as input and inspiration for, for even your craft and your art. Yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, if, if there's any mistake that people make, it's that they end up, you, you wonder why some politician gets people and they find out that they only listen to one newscast, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, of course they believe whatever it is crazy, you know, idea that they have, you know, uh, because they only listen to one source, you know? Well, you, you can't, get everything from one source because most sources have an agenda yes so you want to get as many agendas in your system because in the end the more inputs you have the less you're going to be taken in by some um agenda Yes. 20 agendas are better than one, put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. I have a feeling we could go on, but I also feel like that's an excellent note for us to end on. So thanks for your time and generosity, Miles. Is there anything else I should have asked? Oh, well, I think you've covered it pretty well and, and good luck on your podcast. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, if you're listening right now, don't forget to check out Miles Copeland's book, Two Steps Forward, One Step Back. All right. You take care. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Releasing music today is like putting your CD in the deepest, darkest, and most cluttered corner of a Walmart and expecting random customers to discover it all on their own, don't you think? Well, if you're doing what everyone else is doing, chances are you're going to end up a music commodity. Just one product in a huge store with shelves that keep getting fuller every single day. I'm not saying you should reinvent the wheel. What I'm saying is you need a strategy. And that's why I put together a free training called the Music Money Machine. If you're tired of earning a pittance of streaming royalties and would like to create offer stacks that separate you from the crowd and help you earn a living from your passion, go to musicentrepreneurhq.com slash machine to claim your free training. This has been episode 252 of the New Music Industry Podcast. I'm David Andrew Weeb, and I look forward to seeing you on the stages of the world. Thank you for listening. Music in this episode was brought to you by Brian Young. Wherever you're listening to this right now, please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast.
Hey, thanks for watching Music Entrepreneur. Just so you know, between now and November 19th, 2021, if you purchase any of our e-bundles, courses, or coaching programs on content marketing musician created specifically to help you get results in your music career, we're giving 50% of the proceeds to the education of underprivileged children in South America. This is to honor my late father and grandparents who also contributed greatly to the cause. Head on over to contentmarketingmusician.com com slash products to check out our selection and if you don't see what you need or have a request for some other training feel free to let me know also don't forget to like comment and subscribe if you enjoyed this video